Welcome to Free Media Free Minds. Free Media Free Minds is a program that explores media freedom, diversity, and access to information. My name is Pumezam Tegazi. And I'm Haldi Janssen Daubia. In our program today, we explore the Secrecy Bill, its impact on your and my right to, to our its impact on your and my right to access information, review state accountability, and ensure transparency. Now the secrecy bill sets up the interests of the state versus the citizen's right to access information as guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. Joining us to discuss this further is Sylvia Fallenhoven, journalist and a filmmaker. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you. And Mark Weinberg, Right to Know campaign director. Welcome to the both of you. Good to be here. Um, before we discuss this, let's take a look at this clip by the Right to Know campaign activists explaining the importance of our right to access information. We remember what it was like to live in a society of secrets. We remember that you can't have true freedom and live your freedom without the right to know. We call on our government not to undermine the constitution of South Africa. It would be undemocratic to withhold information from the people of South Africa. We believe that the ruling party should engage the various lobby groups. Gentlemen, we have nothing to hide, and therefore we don't need any bill that will obscure the truth. The truth will set us free. I'm ashamed for the first time in my life to speak in front of my parliament. I am a soldier grouper of Blakish Sur. We've been evicted from the into gateway houses and we decided to stay on Symphony Way for plus minus 18 months before being reallocated to Blakisdor. As a community, we were very frustrated because nobody seems to hear our cry, nobody seems to see our plight, nobody actually cared about us. There's such a lot of bad elements, drug trafficking, human trafficking, prostitution, innocent people get shot, innocent people get killed. I feel that government's responsibility is to inform us, especially the poorest of the poor. We never knew anything until we came to link up with the Right to Know campaign, where we got educated about the surroundings of our rights. We came to understood that we do have rights to oppose laws such as the secrecy bill, and now we are demanding the right to have access to information, the right to know, as well as myself, we all are pushing for a difference. That was a clip showcasing the work of the Right to Know campaign. Mark, I'm going to start with you. It would seem, based on the clip, that have we gone back in time? Because the apartheid government used laws to curtail our right to know. Mm. And the secrecy bill, is this curtailing our right to know? Tell us more. Yeah. It's not so much going back in time, but just realizing the continuity with apartheid, that we still have a government that has to oversee one of the most, if not the most unequal societies in the world. And there are two ways to govern. You can govern by consent, having everyone agreeing, or you can govern with force. 
And as we see the tensions building in our society, we are seeing the government preparing to govern with force again. And the secrecy bill is one of the very visible examples of where they're putting in laws to uh, suppress the people. Now, Mark, in your view, how will the secrecy bill affect citizens' right to access information? Well, as the bill's gone through Parliament, there have been a number of important changes that have been introduced. But the bill still poses a threat to the transparency that our, our constitution guarantees. So you think of things like the Waterkloof Air Force, the Gupta landing of the plane, the president's holiday home in KZN. These are all stories that if the, security, if the secrecy bill had been passed, we would know nothing about because they're national security issues and there'd be a complete blackout on that information. So it's a bill soon to be a law that will allow government to cover up a wide range of uh, things that the public do have a right to know. Mark, give us, a, give us an example before we come to Sylvia, because Sylvia is going to take us through her own experience. But give us an example of what this actual threat means to me as a citizen. Is it just having information? Is it being spy versus spy? What is it? Well, firstly, the bill says that it's to protect the national security. But what are the threats to national security in South Africa? We're not about to go to war with Lesotho. We must understand that this, one of the major threats to our government is the people of South Africa. So we, the people, will be defined as a national security threat. The bill says that anyone who's in possession of a classified document is guilty of a crime and can get between 5 and 25 years in jail. If you are in possession, if I leak a document to Sylvia and Sylvia hands it to Helga, all three of us are guilty of the, of the crime. So there's no public domain defense, which means that even if I put it up on a website, everyone who downloads it, it's still guilty of that and can still go to jail for five to 25 years. So it really criminalizes the entire public uh, for accessing information, which in many cases is legitimately in the public interest. But Mark, I read on your website, the Right to Know website, and you'll give us those details in a minute, um, that the minister also has far-reaching, in, in terms of the, 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 the passing of this bill, the minister will have far-reaching powers which may supersede the rights guaranteed in the constitution. Do I have this? Is yes, this the well, right the original bill said it applied to all of government. And we managed to force through a concession that it should only apply to the security cluster, the spies and the military and the likes. But then at the last minute, the ANC introduced a clause which gave the power to the minister to delegate powers to everyone in government again. So we're ready back to the beginning. If the minister decides that ESCOM has got national security interests, they can have the power to classify all their material secret. Uh, so the minister has wide-ranging powers and very limited oversight. In fact, no independent oversight. They don't have to give any reasons for why they're classifying documents. And they're bound to err on the, fact, on the side of overclassification. Just getting into the habit of classifying everything just in case. Okay, so the just in case what, and this is where we're bringing Sylvia in. Sylvia Volanovan, journalist, filmmaker, producer of the documentary Project Spear, which was part of an SABC Commission documentary series called Truth Be Told. Tell us about your experience when you um, there were certain secrets that you had um, uncovered um, and there was a very strange reaction from the state and the SABC. What did you do? An important part of the story that I did a documentary film on is that the information contained in my film, most of it has been in the public domain. The difference is that very few people have known about it. It's been um, published in, in publications like Noseweek, which is read by a small um, audience. And, and this would have been the first time that an SABC audience would have seen a story about corruption in the apartheid days and how it impacts on us today. Billions were stolen before and during the handover process in the 90s. And in the um, late 90s, this current government was given an opportunity to recover some of this money by a British consultant. And my film is about why did they first sign a contract, 
pay the consultant a big fee, like a million pounds or something, <coughs> and then walk away from the contract. Just suspend all dealings with this consultant who is still confused to this day. And um, some of the conclusions that we come to in the documentary is that there must be collusion between the old guys who stole the money and the new guys who are in power. Um, Mom Sylvia, you, you, you talk about the conclusions, but what did you reveal? What, what we revealed is the details of how much money was stolen, how it was stolen. One of the more specific um, um, parts of my story is that, for instance, APSA Bank. Before it became APSA, it was a lot of small banks, um, and APSA mainly means amalgamated banks of Southern Africa. And the government gave, um, just before we handed over to the new government, gave APSA what they called a lifeboat. The lifeboat at that stage was worth 3.2 billion rand. In today's terms, it can be 10 billion rand, which is probably the size of our current jobs fund. And um, APSA was given this lifeboat because one of those small banks were in trouble. But APSA has grown to become the richest bank on the African continent. So number one, if it was a loan, why aren't they paying it back? And number two, if it was a gift, why didn't they pay gift tax? So those are some of the issues that we bring out in this film. Um, this is mind-blowing. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers are not aware of all of this. Um, we're going to take a short break. You tuned in to Free Media, Free Minds. We'll take a short break. Please stay with us. We're back with Free Media, Free Minds. We're talking about the secrecy bill. Sylvia, let's come back to you. You were explaining to us before the break the impact of your documentary, Project Spear. Um, and the, 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 the little bit of information that you gave us, viewers, was quite illuminating. It would seem that there was collusion between the current state to, um, if I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to suppress um, the true value of apartheid millions. Um, tell us more. Well, you know, I think we, we should accept that uh, during the negotiation process, bonds were formed. The CODESA process um, was not just about hammering out the new South Africa and our new constitution and where we're going from apartheid into the future. It was personal relationships being formed. So the Minister of Defence, Joe Modise, was taught by the old Minister of Defence how to put together the arms deal, for instance. And, and so these guys handed over a very corrupt situation. And our, our oh, option... Can I, can I just stop you there? Just for one second. You're saying that corruption was endemic in the previous government, and that was kind of the legacy that our new government inherited. Yeah, mm -hmm. so and the new government had one of two options. First, we could start with a completely clean slate, or we could learn a few things from these old guys and carry on business as usual. And life is never black or white. So obviously what we then developed as the new South Africa was a little bit of both. There were guys who colluded, there were new guys who were corrupt and who played along with the old guys. And there are people in government who are clean and who are rigorous and who are moral people. And, and what we are now seeing on a very broad front is all these corruption uh, issues coming home to roost, especially ahead of next year's election, and people saying enough is enough. Let's start rooting them out one by one. I, I see Mark nodding his head there. Mm. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? Yeah, to I mean, I think it's really, we're starting to understand South Africa uh, less as a, as a complete break with apartheid and more starting to see the continuities, mm. that this government rules a very similar society and is, uses a lot of the old apartheid tricks. I mean, all the deals that were done with the apartheid business that landed up in our economy, and they want to suppress this information. They want to pass laws to keep it secret. And I mean, Sylvia can tell us how the public broadcaster, which is not the apartheid state broadcaster, has behaved like a state broadcaster in this case. 
So will you please tell us, you took your, your, your documentary, completed work to the commissioning editors at SABC. What was their response? Um, they put it on the schedule. It was due to go out at the end of September last year. Um, shortly before, they said, oh, there are a few problems. We need to make some changes, possibly. Let's delay it, because as you said at the beginning, it was part of a series called Truth Be Told. Let's put it at the end of the series, um, which would have meant that it would go out at the beginning of November. I agreed, and um, we discussed some changes. Suddenly, when it got closer and closer to the time when the documentary was due to be aired, none of my emails were being answered, none of my phone calls um, were being taken by the people that I was dealing with, just silence from the SABC. And on the day that my documentary was supposed to go out, it was on the schedule, on the internet, on all of the official schedules, but they replaced it with something else about agriculture or farming or whatever. No explanation to the viewers, nothing. And yeah, I must ask you, Sylvia, how is this possible? Before you take us through the response, how is it possible in the new South Africa, to coin a really, you know, awful cliche, that this can happen. I mean, Mark in the break told us PIA, which is the Public Access to Information Act, is one of the most progressive <coughs> in the world. And yet, you're being stonewalled to show the truth. This is possible because there are corrupt individuals subverting the system. As, as Mark was saying to us be, before, that we have a great constitution, we have adequate legislation, but these things are not being enacted. And it doesn't take much for a corrupt individual to pressurize the minions at the SABC to make people scared for their jobs and whatever. And that's what's happening. People are subverting the system and people are afraid. Um, Jacob Zuma is not the best president this country has ever had and he has left us a legacy of cronyism, of people being scared for their future, being scared for their jobs and so they do things that are contrary to, mm. to our constitution and to our values um, out of fear. Yeah. Uh, um, Sylvia, before you continue, because I really want to take our viewers through the very serious legal implications that this documentary has had for you, but Mark, tell us would you say that, that, that Sylvia's documentary, in a way, is a whistleblowing act? Um, and how does your campaign protect or, or engage with whistleblowers that I like to know? Tell us about the campaign. Well, I, I think Sylvia's work is the work of fine journalism, mm. ethical journalism that's really trying to put, expose information that's in the public interest. I mean, as Sylvia said, a lot of this information is already in the public domain, but amongst the very narrow urban elite audience, getting it into the SABC and exposing the character of the current government to millions of South Africans is what we really need for the truth to be told broadly. And it's a, it's a courageous act. It's, it's the role that our journalists should be playing. And it's absolutely disheartening to see the approach that the SABC has taken. We saw recently the canning of the big debate we know that uh, controversial talk shows have been cancelled at the last minute, um, commentators blacklisted. So the SABC is really, the independence of the SABC is really under incredible uh, threat at the moment. Ma Mark, um, you, 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 you're talking about public interest. What, what does it really mean and why should it be protected? Well, why should the public interest be protected? is because we live in a democracy and for a democracy to function, we need citizens to be informed mm -hmm. in order to hold government accountable and to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So there has to be access to information. What exactly is in the public interest needs to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Because some people would say it wasn't like that. No? What our media law says, which is very good, is if you, the journalists think it's in the public interest, publish it, and a court can decide afterwards. What the secrecy bill says is we will decide what's in the public interest before through classification. We won't tell you what's been classified, we won't tell you why it's been classified, full stop, end of story. So uh, public interest, there'll always be a debate, was it really in the public interest? And there are mechanisms to decide that that are democratic and transparent and there are ways to decide that they are just plain authoritarian. And you, go, you see, Jacob Zuma is the president now, but his history is one of intelligence. He was the head of the ANC spies in the 1980s, and the people he surrounded himself with come from the intelligence community. 
So it's not surprising that we see the spies getting so much influence in our politics today. Mm, absolutely. Um, Sylvia, um, I'm sure a lot of us would like to know what drove you to go for the government? What? What drove you? Oh, um, you know, the thing is that the SABC has never commissioned investigative documentaries before. And I've been a journalist for a very long time. And this is a story that I was following in the small publication, Nosewick. And I wondered how could one, first of all, get this broader audience, broader audience to know about such an important story? But secondly, how could you make it visual for, for, a, for a television audience? Mm -hmm. So, um, Sylvia, now we, we, we know from our producers and our research that we've not seen the show, despite it, it should have been aired sometime this year already, um, and that you did try to have it aired at a festival and you were stopped. Physically stopped. Tell us when, about that. when the SABC just wouldn't answer any of my calls and just stonewalled me, I started showing it to small audiences because there were some rumors that they were spreading that the film was bad, it wasn't good enough, not up to standard, you know, all those kinds of things. And that was one of the small audiences we were going to show it to at the Friendship Film Festival. They um, got lawyers to write to us at the last minute um, asking for written undertakings that we won't show the film. They sent on a Saturday two highly paid lawyers to Franschuk to ensure that we didn't show even one minute clips of this film. What does the sh are there are there things that 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 your guests say that we shouldn't be knowing about? What do they say? I, I think what's more important is the length to which the SABC is going to. Up to now, the court case, the court action that they've gone along is probably about half a million rand. It's twice mm. as much as the documentary cost them. So what all in all, they've wasted almost a million rand. Sorry to interrupt, but what are they trying to hide? I, I think that we are coming up for an election next year. Some powerful people made a lot of money in the old government. Some powerful people have made a lot of money in the new government. Is it the same people? No, 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 not, <laughs> not the same people. But there are powerful individuals behind the scenes making sure that we don't uh, see this. And just to show you the extent to which they are prepared to go, number one, they've spent all this money on a court case which we are opposing. After I started opposing the court case and quite separately, um, I tended for another series and I was awarded a contract to do four documentaries. That contract is worth about 800,000 Rand. At the last minute, they have frozen the contract. Mm. And for a small company like mine, that kind of action is enough to put me out of business because I now have a large, many months that I was going to dedicate to this project completely mm -hmm. empty and without income. So as I'm sitting here now, my company is almost bankrupt. Personally, I'm in deep trouble mm -hmm. with the banks as a result of what they're doing. And they are hoping that that pressure will push me somehow to stop opposing their court action. So behind the scenes, we have to understand there are some very powerful people who've made a lot of money corruptly and who continue to make a lot of money corruptly. And they mm -hmm. are determined that things like this will not see the light yeah. of day. Um, speaking of powerful people, Mark, um, what kinds of power would the Minister of State Security have versus the power of the citizens? Well, if, if and probably when the secrecy bill gets passed, the Minister has far-ranging power, as I said previously, to delegate uh, uh, classification powers. So he can say, look, we'll give you the power to make documents top secret. And then, I mean, in America, they've got a very developed intelligence system they say there's over, a, I think, 100,000 people with the power to classify things as top secret. So it gets very big and out of control. The minister has the power to hand out the powers. And the minister has the power to give oversight. So if there are complaints, in a lot of cases, the minister's word would be final. Um, so he becomes a very powerful person in government in terms of giving, controlling information. Mark, so... Clearly, the, uh, even before our first break, you spoke about the political legacy from the ANC that Jacob Zuma comes into power with. He comes into power with a contingent of very powerful intelligence um, ANC people, um, and that this has had an impact clearly, as we see now from the, the, the long drawn out but determination for the state to implement the secrecy bill. We see that that is part of that style of government. Um, what do we as citizens, how do we respond to that? Well, I, th I think it's and, yeah. the, the key word has got to be organization. 
we can't fight this as individuals. Mm -hmm. We have to get together. And I think watching that initial clip of the, the work we've done around Parliament, we've now left Parliament. Yes, we've won some important changes to the bill, <coughs> but the bill still remains a threat to our freedom. One of the good things that has come out of this process is the Right to Know campaign. Thousands of South Africans organizing across the country, way beyond the secrecy bill. We're taking on the National Key Points Act. We're taking on the local councillors who are refusing to give information, the local clinics who won't say what their drug supplies are like. Are you saying that this is the extent to which this, that is the kind of information this bill can be um, classified? Just even who no, supplies look, drugs? No, we managed to force Parliament to exclude municipalities. Okay. Of course, the minister could still include them. But we also managed to force Parliament to narrow the definition of what could be justifiably classified. So if we would say that the medication in the local clinic is a national security issue, it would be a bit hard to prove. Of course, they wouldn't have to prove it because classification takes place in secret. But in reality, this bill, because of the work we've done, isn't going to go that far down. The other reality is we live in a de facto state of secrecy. A lot of clinics will not tell you what, medic what, what uh, treatments they have available and how many weeks or months of supplies they have. Even though citizen groups like the Treatment Action Campaign ask for this information systematically and regularly. So there's existing secrets that the Right to Know campaign works on at a local level. We're fighting the question of the SABC and other media freedom issues. The right to communicate because information in a society like ours can get out and a few business people and a few people in NGOs know it. And you would say it's in the public. Yeah. Yeah. But the reality is the majority of our people live outside of towns and have no access unless a body like the SABC can be properly transformed. Um, before we wrap up, any closing remarks from... Can, can I just ask before yeah. we go <laughs> okay, to closing okay. remarks, if I can, I wanted to check with, with Sylvia. Project Spear, why have we not seen it on Cape Town TV yet? You'll be the first to know as soon as my <laughs> lawyers give me the go ahead. And I just want to say, you asked about what can be done. This is exactly what we should be doing. And as, as Mark said, being active citizens, using our media. And well done to you guys, because this is the kind of discussion that would never happen on the SABC, and they should shame themselves that community TV is showing them the way. Yeah. <laughs> Any closing remarks from me, Mark? I think as South Africans, we must still be inspired by Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela taught us that if a law is unjust, you have a moral responsibility to disobey it. And at some point, we might reach that point where we have to say information is so vital that I'm willing to go to jail for 25 years under the Secrecy Act mm -hmm. for it to get out. Sylvia, any closing remarks? Well, I, I, I think that one of the most important things that has come out of this discussion is that our democracy is fragile. It needs to be safeguarded and we have to be active citizens. We have to every day make sure that we guard this precious thing that people have died for. Absolutely. I want to say thank you to our guests, Mark Weinberg from the Right to Know campaign, Sylvia Volanovan, filmmaker and journalist, um, and also director and producer of documentary Project Spear. It would seem that the right to know is becoming an act of courageousness, as Mark indicated, that the search for truth is indeed a democratic responsibility that we have. Um, let us not have the apartheid secrets follow us into our democracy, but it's challenge our right to know. Thank you for joining us. I'm Halgi Jansen Daubia. And I'm Pumazan Tegazi. Please catch the repeats of the show every Friday morning at half past seven and every Sunday night at 10.30. You what we've been watching, Free Media Free Minds. Till next time. I have studied the idea of a